Tilburg University and Mind Labs present Taisig Talks. Welcome to the 17th edition of the Taisig Talks. My name is Peter Sponk. Today with me, I have two guests. This is uh, Dimitar Stereonov and Eva van Massenhoven. Both of them are working in machine translation. Uh, they have slightly different perspective on machine translation and it i think it will be an interesting topic to cover during this next uh, the next 50 minutes or so um, because uh, machine translation has increased in quality a lot in recent years i can remember a while ago uh, that uh, i i tried to translate things let's say 10 15 years ago and i always had to work further on those translations um, to make sure that they were correct. So you could get a basic translation of a text, but get a basic understanding of what the text said, but it was not really good. And these things are getting much better. For instance, I see at the university, where usually they try to send uh, letters in both Dutch and English, that they do the English text with an automatic translation. I can recognize this because they're usually undersigned by someone whose name has a van in the middle, and that's translated to off which uh, is of course not correct so the question is of course when does a computer rec uh, recognize that a, uh, a a name should not be translated so we are evidently not that far yet at least not in the translations that i used online but uh, i should not be the one talking uh, i should be the two of you so um can you uh, maybe quickly introduce yourselves uh who you are what kind of work you do what your interests are not too deep we can go later into your particular topics but sure go ahead, go okay. ahead. so yeah i'm eva van Massenova. i'm an assistant professor in uh the cognitive science and ai uh, i teach there some courses like deep learning and advanced data processing um and my background is in linguistics so i first studied french and spanish linguistics and then after that i um did a master in artificial intelligence and i think is this combination that then led to me researching machine translation because it really combines linguistics with ai very well um, and my main research interest at the moment is uh, related to gender bias and in machine translation and language technology. Okay, I'm, I'm sure that we're going to get to talk about that. So, Dimitar. Um, so, my name is Dimitar Stereonov. I, uh, I am also an assistant professor in uh, Tivork University in the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence. Um, I did my PhD in probabilistic logic, so nothing to do with uh, machine translation, nothing to do with translation at all or language. Uh, but then I moved to, to Dublin um, to, well, to work actually there in a company for machine translation using my computer engineering, software engineering skills, actually. Uh, so basically, uh, I got to know about machine translation there. And after a couple of years, I moved to academia back um in the team of uh, professor Andy Way in WC University where I worked on machine translation with industry so we were working on different projects with uh with industry partners and after that I I came here to Tilburg University and continue working on machine translation currently I am uh, working on a project for um sign language uh, machine translation basically uh, so the project is called sign on it's one of the largest um uh, consortium with uh, kind of a, of European funding at the moment. Um, okay, that's it. I think. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, so then, can you, any of uh, both of you together, maybe uh, give me a kind of a general introduction to machine translation? So, what are we talking about? Um, maybe a bit of the history of machine translation. Shall I uh, yeah, start with to, what I know? Uh, and I can, can fill in the yeah. gaps. So I think machine translation was primarily something that linguists were interested in, like uh, back in the days. Um, so what, what actually what does a linguist do? A linguist is someone that works on language and um, more on the like structural parts of language so not not studying literature but it can be like studying how a language evolved or studying how two languages compare so the more 
how do you say, like maybe the more technical aspect of language in a sense. Okay. And so um, linguists had started with this idea that maybe they could come up with some rules, translation rules that would convert the one language into another grammar rules or just like dictionary rules and so on. And I think that's really how, how the field uh, started. Um, and this was mainly, these approaches were mainly, I think, first popular during the war, I think, when they needed to decipher uh, a lot of texts, right? I think it was in the, and then there in was the a, 50s, right? Yeah, After there was the... quite a, a boom, basically, uh, because people needed this kind of things. And then um, because of that, also more money came to the fields. And there was this, this machine translation boom, which then kind of got cut off with the uh, Alpac report, I think, in the 60s. Yeah where they basically were like, okay, you managed to make something that worked in a very particular domain, like, for instance, um, weather forecasting. It has a very limited vocabulary, very mm -hmm. short sentences, limited grammar. In this case, yes, your rules somehow work. But actually, in any other case where there is more ambiguity, where the language is richer, it would fail. And so there was a like a period that people were not interested in machine translation anymore. They kind of gave up on it. And then there came a, a search again, I think around yeah. in the 80s or in something, 80s, yes. with statistical machine translation. First, it was the example-based. Example-based, yeah. which is not... Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, what, what is that? How, how would that work? Well, uh, so the, the initial idea was when you have rules and then you have like vocabularies and rules how to connect like from... English vocabulary to, to uh, Russian vocabulary, and then the rules how the certain words that are translated from one language to another form a sentence. Right? It's and it's very basic. You would have like a big yeah. database, for instance, and if you encounter "I work" and then in another sentence you encounter again "I work," then you could just kind of copy this "I work," "je travaille" in French, for instance. Just take it, and then the next part of the sentence. Take it from sure. another but that, example. That, that's that's the, word by word or group or words by group of exactly. words. But you said example based. Yeah, yeah that's it's... so that was the, the so after the rule based, then there was the idea of okay, as Eva said, we've seen different examples of, of this sentence, right? Instead of instead of having to to uh, have all the time rules, why don't we ignore the rules and just take these examples and use this as translations, right? If you have I work and you don't care about the linguistic structure of, of the sentence, then you say, OK, I seen, I work and I see je travaille. Je travaille, je travaille, yeah. je travaille. <laughs> yeah. And then you basically can say, OK, every time when I see I work, then this is my example. I take this and I put it as a translation. It's a super simple approach, but it actually worked better. But if you then talk about examples, is that the examples are then the sentences you've already you have in your corpus in your data. Okay, so it would be yeah. whole sentences or sub sentences yeah. or something. Yeah, like that. and you're yeah. just gonna mix and match if you want. You're just gonna find particular parts that you already have somewhere in your database. So then the whole thing, the only thing, the only thing you need is a big database with lots of sentences, and if you cannot find the sentence, you do the word by word translation or something like that. Exactly, yeah. and this was cheap and kind of worked well because the, the linguistic approach was very, very complicated. It, uh, I mean, people would work on it and someone else adds to it and it becomes really complicated. So this example-based approach actually worked well and was very cheap also. You only need data. But of course, as you can already imagine, this is not the way you do translation. You don't just pick things that match here and there and then assemble them. It, there are well, it, actually i don't see why you wouldn't do it like that <laughs> well like for instance i uh, i used to work or something yeah then you want work to be work belongs to i and needs to have the same ending but maybe you don't have the sentence i used to work you have mm -hmm. i used to and work or something like this if you just put all this together then work will have the wrong ending it might have an ending for you or we or yeah i mean so in, the in, examples that you have in your data are not consistent with the text that you're given then you have some errors and that actually led to to the uh, to the statistical machine translation okay uh, yeah. where they were saying okay 
Now we have these examples and we can learn from these examples. But why not, as I said, instead of taking the whole sentence or a sub-sentence, we just try to figure out which phrases match. And phrases usually would be something like one gram, two grams, so one, one token or one word, then two words together, three, okay. and so on. And then in the, what was it, in the 80s, 90s, IBM started building these uh, alignment models where you can have like two different, uh, so languages, so you can have data from different languages. And then they were trying to figure out which word we were aligned with which other word. And then you have the IBM one, two, three, four, and five, I think, models. Mark, wait a minute. So does that mean that the idea is so you give the computer two texts, one original text, one translation, maybe translation made by a human or something like that, mm -hmm. and then just let the computer in, in some way figure out what things would map in the translation. So build those example databases that you talk about automatically, yeah. but of course then it would not be uh, a certainty like this example fits with this 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 thing here but it could maybe it could be several possibilities but exactly. they have some yes. some yeah. some 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 chance that they are there some yeah. Some, yeah. some probability probabilistic indeed it's, it's yeah. really based on probability so you try to, to figure out how many times the word um uh, so how many times a certain word in the translation that uh matches um or exists if you have the word i in the english side right and then you try to match I with uh, ik, let's say, in Dutch, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but you, and that probably that will be the highest probability, but then you have other also matches because that's how your data is. And then you have like a lower probability for other words in, in Dutch. And then you build these phrase tables where you have one word in English and another word in, in Dutch, and then you align or assign probability. What is the probability of translation of this word to that word? Can, can I can I probably do that with an example? I so you would have a Dutch word, for instance, that can have two different meanings. Uh, yeah, or, or if yeah. you want, like take the English word "work." It can be both the noun, like yeah, uh, yeah, werk, verb, yeah, but it can also be the verb. So it can be werkt uh, or werk, werken. Mm -hmm. or so there are many possible translations but you can also maybe translate work in another way uh, job uh, yeah. for instance yeah. in dutch and so you get like a whole list of probable translations right. some more probable than others yeah but the basic translation would simply be how often does this word occur with that word mm -hmm. but then you're probably going to look at the rest of the sentence yeah, exactly. and, and in that statistical model, however that is constructed, you could then map, okay, because this is, these other words, for instance, occur in the sense that probably this one has higher likeliness to be the correct translation, although you still have to connect them together in some way. Then. And yeah. the thing is that when you, so when you build these tables, uh, these translation tables, you have translation per word, but also per two words. So two grams or three words, three grams or four yeah. words, right? So you you don't only constrain the translation into a word by word translation. So we don't have a, mm -hmm. a, a table only on words, but you have also on phrases. And this phrase, uh, again, can be one, two, three, and four. I think usually it's up to four, Max five, and six, five, yeah. yeah. Because then it becomes too difficult to match. Yeah, probably the yeah. sentences have become too rare. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, once you start generating translations, you look into these tables and you uh, try to figure out the, what is the, the sentence that, is, that has the most likeliness, the, yeah. most hi the highest uh, likelihood. Yeah, and you so you mentioned n-grams as before, and I've, been, yeah. I've worked with n-grams just in a theoretical sense, and I let students write programs where they have to do things with n-grams and make predictions based on n-grams. So the prediction would be you have word A, B, and C, what would be the next word? And exactly. then, but yeah. then the thing is that the prediction can change based on uh, how big the n-gram is. So if you look, okay, I only look at the last two words, then I can predict the next word with a certain confidence. And if I look at the last three words, I get another word that is predicted. And it doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the case, I have noticed that the correct prediction is the one that has the most words included. It could be something else. It could be a shorter one. Basically, the quality of the prediction goes up first when you 
take the, the, the more words that you use for the prediction, and but then it goes down again, probably because you don't have enough data that has that many words. Is this more or less what, what happens? Is that also why, it, for instance, is limited to five? I think it's limited mainly because it becomes computationally yeah, too expensive. Because, because you have to build these this matrices. And usually, so as I said, you have these uh, IBM models that were developed mm -hmm. indeed by IBM in the 80s, 90s, I think. And based on this, you figure out these alignments between words and phrases. And each of the, so the first one I think is word per word, the second one is the, the consecutive phrases, and the third one is more complicated and so on. Mm -hmm. So you try to, to invoke the first model, then the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. Uh, I think that there is also a sixth model, but then usually it's only until the fifth. And each model is more complicated than the other one. Mm -hmm. And the longer you make the sequence, the more computationally expensive this becomes. Okay, I would be very interested to talk about that further because I yeah. certainly <laughs> see in my mind ways to do this really fast because I know there are lots of data techniques to store whole text without exactly. any problems. But, uh, well, that becomes a bit too technical for you. And I'm sure that the people of IBM thought about that as well. <laughs> but that, that is why, so that was uh, in the 80s and 90s, right? And then people were thinking about these computational models and how things will, will be done effectively, not so much efficiently, maybe at that time. But then, of course, as you mentioned, you have this restriction of, let's say, four or five grams, right? And then, of course, what you would like to do is to take the whole context. And that's why somehow in 2000, and what was it? 14, 14 yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, these models were there before already. Um, but the breakthrough, I think, yeah was around that time, yeah, in that 14. the fields shifted to deep learning yeah. and to, yeah, neural machine translation, for okay. example. Yeah, the um, previous TICE talk was about deep learning, but I think the whole explanation of how that worked was a bit too technical for most of people to understand. Yeah. But can, can you say a bit about this? So what, what, what is the change that you that you then make? So why why would something like that be an improvement? I think on the higher level, I don't think that we should delve in, in technical details here, but so in, in phrase-based, what you have is like, take this word, check the, the previous words, what is the probability, try to find the, the highest likelihood of the sentence or, or the R max, and then do this for the next one and shift the window, right? You have a limited window. With neural machine translation, and especially with uh, recurrent neural networks, you are allowed to take all the sequence into account. So you build like a context vector of the input uh, sentence um, as, as a one whole thing. You don't have to break it into, into phrases or into words. You can pass and process the whole, uh, the whole sentence. Sequence or sentence yeah, in sequence. one go. And then once you do that, you and, can- And you, mean you feed the sentence to the neural network as a sentence. As a sentence. As a sentence. But, and do you split the sentence in words or do you letter by letter? Or what, what do you do? There are different approaches. You have yeah. um, word per word. So I think the first was word per, per word. Yeah. Then in 2016, there came the byte per encoding yeah. where words will be split in support units. And the reason was to limit the vocabulary because uh, uh, I'm not sure how much words are there in the English vocabulary, but around 150, 200,000 or something like this. So if you build, well, maybe even more. No, uh, well, I, 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 I love that my students use a dictionary and the standard dictionary is something like 50,000 words. So that's still doable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that probably if you do all the words, then it yes. becomes, because I understand all those 50,000 words. So then yeah. probably there, are, for, for them, there's many words that I don't understand. But for technical reasons, if you have all the words that exist in your corpus, usually this would be computationally very expensive. Yeah. So you try to limit this. And the way to do it without losing uh, unfrequent words is to break words into support units that are frequent in your corpus. And so basically what will happen is that your vocabulary will no longer be per words, but per sub words. And I, so it, it looks, so I, I try to understand this, but I, I'm not a specialist in this. Um, so you would say, well, we have the word uh, 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 construct, and we have the word uh, confuse, and mm -hmm. we have the, all they have the word, they have cool. to support con in there. Yeah. So you just feed that support to the network, and then you expect the network to now focus on the words that start with con, and then 
Um, I, I give usually the example of lower and yeah. tallest. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, so the words lower yeah, and lower. tallest. And what? Tallest? Uh, yes. Tallest. Oh, tallest. Yeah, tallest. yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And then if you break it into low and er and to and est, so est, mm -hmm. then what this will allow you is then to create words that are uh, with this uh, suffixes also, like high, if you have high, and then you can create high est or higher. Yeah, right? yeah, sure. And, and so you don't need to have higher and highest as well in your vocabulary, your mm -hmm. dictionary that you're using for, for the neural network, but you can have low, tall, high, er, and est. Yeah, and and sure. This, but that, are we now going back to the to the rules that was the very original? Uh... Well, but these Viper encodings are not based on linguistic uh, knowledge at all. At all, it's just like uh, whichever supports are statistically most yeah frequent in your data. So there are some uh, linguistic approaches as well to splitting the words that are mm -hmm. yeah based on actual um, morphemes or so on. So so mm -hmm. meaningful units in in language but for some reason they work less good yes. than uh yeah the statistical approach which is often the case in uh, yeah so is it so so what does the deep learning approach which you said started in around 2014 what does it do so it is a statistical approach it is a statistical approach yes which you and you just feed text, text. to it to mm -hmm. train it uh, to make translations yeah and the text you do feed in the form of well you can you can do the, the word uh, morsels or the the subwords or you can do it and, and depending on the approach you get mm -hmm. better or worse mm -hmm. yeah there is also work on uh, character based uh, uh, MT where they would use cnns usually for that so that you kind of have the whole sequence of of the sentence uh, feeding into a CNN. Um, so that's another type. That's of another type of. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole idea of the neural machine translation systems is an encoder decoder. So one neural network that encodes everything into an intermediate representation, and another that takes this and generates word or character or subword per word, uh, the output sentence or the target sentence. And it is probabilistic, as, as we said, because basically it will uh, try to get the next word with highest probabilities, probability conditioned on the previous words and on this hidden representation. I, I think many people have lost you now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that maybe main... we, should, we don't need to go too deep no, into the technology, okay. but uh... the, the main advantage, I think, so with statistical machine translation, we were basically translating small parts of a sentence and then gluing it together by running another model over it and making it somehow fluent. Yeah. Yes. But now with deep learning, we are encoding the entire sentence at once, which is good because in language often there are connections between words that are further away from each other than mm -hmm. two words in between or three. There are maybe maybe I say something and then there comes I again or another verb that connects to I yeah. and this needs to be conjugated correctly and so this is a great advantage of 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 doing the way we're doing it now with the entire sentence that you don't lose track of what you're what you've been doing and what you're mm. going to do basically yeah one thing that i was always uh, always afraid of a little bit with something like deep learning is okay you have this enormous structure you have a huge amount of data because of course that that's one of the things that you need with deep learning and i assume it's the case here as well that you need big data sets to 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 train such a network and then the network is trained and it does a nice job and think yeah but i want to improve it a bit but i have no idea where to improve it do i need to feed more than, because it makes certain mistakes how do i get those out because now i i don't actually know what it is doing internally yeah yeah and that's the big uh, <laughs> downside <laughs> indeed. So it, with statistical it was much more clear you you could see the phrase tables you could see what are the probabilities you could run something and get 
the, the translation, then pass it through a language model and see also the language model, how it does to correct some things. And it was all based on these fresh errors and statistics. And it was- And I could give easy. my students a little example and they could compute by hand oh, yeah. what the probability would be here and there. And you would understand, okay, it made this mistake because it doesn't know this that this word came before that. And But now, yeah, with neural networks, sometimes it's awesome. Yeah. And sometimes it's really bad. <laughs> and yeah, it's what are the reasons? overall it's better than statistical machine translation. But I think this is one of the reasons why why many companies are still using statistical machine translation because although neural methods are better, they will not know, or it's also hard to predict where they will make a mistake. Exactly. While with statistical, we would know this is gonna be hard for the machine. Yeah. So we can have someone check some of these sentences, but with neural. Yeah. It's, it's a neural, the neural approach does not give you a confidence of the translation. You just get it and this is what you. No, you, you can get a, a value that states how confident the network is. Usually you have like a, instead of getting only one word, you can get uh, the top five translations and based on the probabilities uh, or the, the connections that the network does it can give you like what is the 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 confidence of this thing, right? The, the translation that it, that it generates. But at the end of the day, if you want to trace it back to the neurons, no, yeah, the <laughs> neurons you can't. And and sometimes with neuro, what happens is that you have unpredicted uh, unpredictable uh, errors. While with statistical, you know what will be translated incorrectly. And that's why, as Eva said, companies prefer still statistical because there you 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 don't use translation, uh, machine translation, for uh, to, to give the raw output directly to your clients, but you use machine translation to get some raw, raw output. Then this raw output is um, postulated by professional translators, and it is much easier for professional translators sure. to deal with errors that they are familiar and or they know that they are going to happen in the next job that they're getting. Yeah, oh. so this is actually uh, last last time we had the Tashi mm -hmm. talk. It also came up that the idea of uh, uh, computer creativity, computer creating images, for instance, which is also done with deep learning, and then you get the question: Okay, are, are you can you replace artists? And usually that's not the case because you, you, the computer can generate stuff, but that's not actually what you want. But you can indicate: Oh, this should be a bit different. This should be a bit different. And but but the job for the for the artist becomes a lot easier because you get a lot of so work that you normally would do in, in a month would now take one or two days because the computer does a lot of the, the mundane work for you and this provides the basis. And I assume this is with translation also the case. That And uh, then the question would be, okay, at one point, do, don't you need a translator anymore? Is that point in sight? Because I don't believe it is. No, I also don't believe it is. Um, but why not? <laughs> what what do, what we need to 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 yeah. make the computer even more independent from from humans in making uh, translations? There are a lot of factors, I, I'd say. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> like um, even between translators, between people, when you generate something, sure. right? When you create art, when even if you're given the the same model. There are differences, right? The same thing is with translation as well. When you're given one sentence to translate or one text to translate, different people can generate different translations. Uh, now, usually this will be without errors, especially when people, when the, the translators are professional translators. With neuro, uh, with machine translation, sorry, you can't guarantee that that there will be always a correct translation, even if the quality gets very high and claims of uh, what was it, human parity. Uh, super uh, superhuman parity. Are that already claims? That there, oh, yeah. are, there is a paper with a title like this, right? Yes. Yeah, but the paper can have a title, but then maybe maybe the content of the paper is. No, the we can't do that the, yet. The, no, no. The, they are aligned. Yeah. <laughs> so. Title and content were aligned. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think. That I mean, it depends on what you consider superhuman. Is it like superhuman at the the pace at which it translates? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, is it superhuman? in terms of quality when you compare to a professional translator and not just someone you've recruited somewhere randomly, then uh, I think the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. 
but, but of course there are companies that do they 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 have machine translation systems and then they have like uh, a, a crowd uh, crowd uh, that actually does the post dating so on your phone you get the translation and then you post it and then you send it back and together with the other peers uh, you work on separate pieces of the text and that's much more easy mm -hmm. efficient quick and, and cost effective for the company but then of course these people not always are trained professional translators. No. And if you take this as, as uh, kind of your baseline, then perhaps machine translation can reach at that level. Uh, but when compared to professional and translators... In a particular context as well, because, yeah. yeah, if you translate a novel compared to translating weather forecasts or a sure. car manual, you know, the, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's so it's almost a one to one mapping, you know, the words that are used there are unambiguous, the the structures are repetitive. This yes, I think in this case a machine can outperform a human depending on how you're gonna measure these things, but mm -hmm. uh, but for things that require a bit more creativity, where the language is a lot richer, I think we're far from yeah, yeah that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when I was younger, I uh, I had a couple of friends who were aspiring writers, and to 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 earn some money, they did translations for for publishers. And basically, what they did is they uh, I saw one working. So basically, okay, I still have to translate this page. And he sat behind the computer. I was basically typing like this, not even thinking, just translating sentence by sentence by sentence. And I thought, okay, well, I think a computer could do the same thing, even then, uh, because it's basically a word by word for word translation. But I think also that is why these kind of books that were published by these publishers, but generally, I would consider them bad. And uh, usually, it's not worth to invest that much in in a translator. But if you are going to talk about, let's say, uh, literature, uh, and then you probably need. Uh, I, I wonder how much a computer could actually contribute to such a translation. Yeah, I mean, it. I sometimes use it as well to translate, right? And I think it's kind of handy because it. sometimes you need to retrieve words and it just puts like a potential translation candidate there and often it's a good one, but still you need to uh, shift things around and 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 make changes so yeah but so like companies like google and like dpl they provide quite good general translation tools mm -hmm. um, these tools are trained on some data and there are also other tools that you can use to train your own machine translation mm -hmm. systems and let's say that you gather all the novels of harry potter and related mm -hmm. uh, literature and then you have the parallel corpor corpus english french let's say and then you train your own machine translation system, then perhaps this translation system would be much better translating the, 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 the legend of Narnia, for example. Yeah, so something in the same style. Something yeah. in the yeah. same style from English to, to, to French, then, for example, Google or, or uh, DPL, which are generic models, right? So your domain specific, your focus model can be much better than, than other models. But then again, you somebody still needs to check how good it is. Because, sure. uh, and yeah, the more context it requires, the, the more harder it gets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I think we we pretty much laid out what uh, where we stand currently uh, in, in general with machine translation technology and uh, possibilities. But I know, uh, especially you, Ava, you look uh, and you mentioned that already in where things go. Um, wrong in a sensitive way and can can you tell a bit about that and, and what you can do about these things yeah so this is um something that so i started working on machine translation and i wanted to integrate more linguistic knowledge because back then it was still statistical machine translation and i noticed that issues related to subject and verb for instance were still there which are actually they should be easy issues right the, yeah, this is part, you of the, be able to recognize. This is part of the grammar yeah so this is not so free and loose as like the semantics of things so i was like okay this actually bothers me that machine translation can't do that 
and so we can do what cannot do proper uh, subject verb agreement for instance and uh, okay maybe more specific what you mean by agreement yeah i, I like, think i know what you like mean I but said i said before like i might be fake i who am an assistant professor at Dilworth university previously worked and work should agree with i when you translate it into french but a statistical machine translation system looks at a couple of words at a time so it will not know that yeah, i is a subject. but this is specifically a problem for instance for uh, translating things from english to another language because in english verbs when you use the same verb for many different nouns yeah uh, i worked you worked he worked she worked they worked it's all worked yeah but in french and in dutch for instance they they can be different That's but this kind of problems occur on many levels uh, among many languages because sure. every language has different ways of expressing certain things and so this kind of we call it a one-to-many relation yeah. so where one word can have multiple good translations let's say these are these are very problematic for machine translation systems and so initially i wanted to just you know use my grammar knowledge and like connect things together so that at least it would get the ending right um, and also with this in mind, I started looking at uh, gender because in, in English, for instance, you would say I'm, I'm a nurse uh, or I'm a doctor and you don't know, am I, am I a man or a woman, uh, basically. Um, but when you translate this into many other languages, French, Spanish, uh, Slavic languages as well, you would need to pick a different ending for happy or doctor or nurse or whatever I am at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that in mind, I was like, okay, it would be, it would be really nice to, to have a system that can generate the correct form depending on what you say your gender is. Um, so that's something that I, I started working on. Can you be explicit about the sensitivity here? Uh, well, yeah, so that's something that actually came later, I think, because for me, this wasn't a sensitive topic. I was okay. just like, okay, we need to get the grammar right, right? Uh, yeah. Thinking yeah. really purely as a linguist. Then I started looking into that and I got a bit, I don't know, I, I think I, I was a bit in shock because I saw that, oh, nurse is always translated into the female form. Doctor is always translated into a male form. If you're smart, it's always male. If you're pretty, you're always a, a woman. And and I I started using Google Translate and I it was one astonishing moment after another, you know, like I am intelligent male. I am <laughs> beautiful male. I am... Uh, beautiful but not intelligent female so the system had picked up like a bunch of things that are interesting as well i think from a societal point of view because this technology has basically picked up and the technology that, that, that made those translations is the deep it's, learning technology or is it the statistical models what, what these is were it? these were deep learning models okay. um and yeah the problem actually yeah is related to deep learning because deep learning in the way that words get a meaning in a deep learning model it is done by looking at the context and so basically you define a word by the context that surrounds it so uh, for instance beautiful will probably have appeared in the corpora often in the context of women or she or and so on mm -hmm. and so forth but this then becomes part of the meaning of that word in that, that's how these systems rep make give meaning to words and so but that is probably that not only the meaning that the system gives but there's also the meaning that we give in a sense yes uh, but we hopefully have a way of kind of correcting for this or for instance when you would be speaking and you say i'm beautiful then i will know as a well, either uh, he's a man or he prefers the, the male pronoun, so I'm going to translate this correctly. But the machine has no way anymore at that point of, of correcting, and it starts over-generating. Uh, so, if, for instance, if in the corpus, 80% of the time nurse was translated in female form and 20% in the, the, the male form, then the system will basically always output it as a female form. Because that has the highest likelihood of being the correct translation. It's the highest Except likelihood. maybe if it looks at a bigger context. 
Or yeah. Is that not how you solve it. Yeah. Uh, well, I provide context in the sense that I wanted the system to be able to, I wanted the user to be able to say, for instance, I prefer female pronouns, and then it can generate the correct translation. So basically, it would be something like highlighting this word is ambiguous. I cannot decide here he or she because I don't have the information. So tell me what you prefer, or at least that the system would indicate, look, I made a choice here and I decided that this is male or something like that, mm -hmm. because current systems just... Sure, and I understand it because you just get a whole bunch of text and you, you train the system with that and there's a lot. And if you want to do it, I think like you do, but maybe I, I'm, you have a much smarter way, you would have to label this all with this is the female translation, this is the male translation, so that you can actually tell the computer maybe it has a hidden tag, this is female. Exactly. And then you say, I give you the hidden tag with the sentence that I want translated and now it becomes female. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly indeed. Uh how I did it first at the speaker level. So I would just gather also information about the person who is speaking. And then I would train the system with that information, hoping then that the system would, if I then indicate female, for instance, that it would generate the right mm. um, okay. endings. But this is, of course. That's the first ID. Yeah, that's the first <laughs> ID. And it needs to, it's more complicated than that. And these I, kind of issues are, there are different types of issues in different languages. Um, I started working more and more on gender. I mean, there are also languages where people just say things in different ways, depending on their gender. I think uh, Japanese is one of those languages where there is a male-like speech and a female-like speech and doesn't have necessarily anything to do with the endings. It's just okay. that when yeah. you say things this way, this is like the female way of saying it. So, I mean, languages really differ. So yeah, the, the, there's also no one fit solution. And I think that's what makes it hard. And I think that's why it's not solved also at this moment. Because yeah, I had talks with Google about it, Google Translate, and they, yeah, they were like, yeah, can you provide us with a solution <laughs> for all our language pairs? And I was, yeah, I said, well, if I could, I would, I would, but. I don't see it myself immediately. So, if I if I may may add something Please. here, I, I think that because we started from the history of machine translation, yeah. what what we are doing from the fifties until now now is just abstracting stuff away, and we started with this linguistic knowledge that we try to code, and I say we. I mean, they yeah, yeah. that time, right? <laughs> the, the, scientists the scientists in general, <laughs> <the> time, <yes>. <laughs> people. <laughs> Yeah, we try to code this linguistic knowledge into into forming sentences in from one language to another, so translating sentences from one language to another. Then things got abstracted because it was very difficult for people to actually work on all these rules for all these possible language pairs. And then we got the example base and then further abstracted to the statistical where you get these tables and so on, where still you could see how things are. And now we have bridge to this even higher abstraction level where you just throw a bunch of data into a neural network and you don't know exactly what's happening and there it's difficult to actually enforce some sort of li mm -hmm. linguistic um uh structure or, or i don't know how you call it yeah to to make the the language being more linguistically sound in terms of what you want to get as a translation mm -hmm. and i think that also links to your question about how good uh, machine translation can reach, uh, can become, um, or is at the moment. Yeah, so this is one of the problems that I personally have with, with deep learning in general is if you have, and there's so many problems that you can approach with deep learning, machine translation is one, generating images is another, game playing is one, so there are many of these things you can do, mostly things that are based on pattern recognition, which again, machine translation, I assume, is mostly you try to recognize certain mm -hmm. patterns. And this is so much better than everything we did before that everybody is now doing, doing the deep learning. But there are certain limits there, which you might have been able to solve if you have worked more in, on the other approach that you had before. Yeah. But because deep learning gives now a better result, everybody is focused on that. I, I agree uh, <laughs> to some extent with, with that, because I'm actually afraid that now we've reached this kind of plateau with deep learning and it's 
it's very hard to get any better results at this point. And adding linguistic knowledge is very difficult in these systems. And, and even if you do it like I did, the results are not always what you expect them to be. And you have mm -hmm. no clue why in this case it works and why in that case it doesn't. And so, yeah, sometimes I wonder whether we should keep on building on some of the previous stuff we had or... And, and would it be, because what you see now is you let you, you give a text to Google Translate or a better translation system, although Google Translate is pretty good, I would say. And then you get something out of it and then a human takes it up and continues with it and improves it. So you could also think, oh, let's, let's just add something at the end. And actually, this has been done for other machine learning technologies as well in the past, where you say, look, this technique works nice, but it gives you an approximate solution. But once you have the approximate solution, you can use this other technique to continue with it and then make it much better. I, I can give an example about that. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, <laughs> as I said, uh, in Dublin, I was working with companies, and uh, we work on a automatic post editing for... Uh, machine translation, it was for Microsoft, for the, the menus of the products of Microsoft. Um, and so they had their statistical machine translation system that would generate uh, text. So I don't remember. Uh, yeah, it was actually uh, German and Spanish, I think. So we had this German and Spanish uh, translations, which would originate from the statistical model that they had or models. And then uh, we were tasked to actually build a, a, an automatic post-editing system. Thus, given the raw empty output, try to improve this to correct some errors. Um, and the way that we did this with a neural model. And we got awesome results. I think we improved significantly with like 20, 30% of accuracy. And it went really high, the, the performance. And of course, we were very happy. Uh, everybody was happy, Microsoft were like, yay, great. And so then they gave us uh, output from their neural systems. And their neural systems were a bit higher, let's say, than the statistical models that they have. And then we, run, we ran our uh, automatic post-editing systems and the results were not better. So we didn't get an improvement. Mm -hmm. And because actually you had neural, neural combined together, pretty much the same sort of yeah. transformations. And then if you think about it as a filtering system, you get two types of similar filters that don't mm -hmm. add uh, additional kind of knowledge or, or uh, they have not, not so much impact. So if you have like the old technology and then you plug something else as a new technology on top, you get much uh, better improvements. And there was a reason why a company would do that because why should you throw away all your other work that you have done on the statistical yeah. models when you can just actually train some very simple NM uh, NMT-based automatic post-editing uh, systems and then just improve all the translations that you had yeah. before. Um, so if we see now, okay, we are now at the stage or at the era of deep learning and neural machine translation. So perhaps in a year, two, five, ten, I don't know, we will get this extra or, or, or new technology that we can actually glue on top of the NMT and improve to post-editing, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. So I'm, I'm thinking now um, about um, AlphaGo and AlphaZero. Because mm. so, okay, there's game playing programs, but AlphaGo plays Go, but it's initially trained on human games. And then uh, uh, machine learning uh, and neural network training is done after that with self-play. And then it becomes a really strong player. And then AlphaZero throws away all the human knowledge and just trains on self-play. And it is a lot better. So I can imagine that it becomes, if, if something like this also is the case for translations, then combining two systems might not actually be an improvement over just feeding these sentences to a deep learned model and then leave it at that. Perhaps, yeah. But I guess that that's what they do with uh, big language models nowadays, right? Where they just throw in a lot of text to build a language model, which then language model, especially if it is a multilingual language model, can be used also for translation. But like, so far they don't work as well as... Yeah, I think that we're still, we still have to push uh, to get good results, like fine tuning on, on parallel corpora and et cetera, to get actually good translation. But these language models like M, like 
So yeah, they remove the need for all the parallel data, mm, which yeah. is often, I mean, it's not an issue for English and French, but yeah, if you take some languages that are low resource, then yeah. yeah, I was actually interested in that. So you have, you have these, these languages where people say they're afraid these languages die out because there are too few people speaking them. But if you would have the ability to, to automatically translate to or from such a language, that would help keeping such a language, well, at least readable, understandable, producible, etc. cetera. Um, so, but then you don't have that yeah, much data to work with. Exactly. That would be, the, that's the issue with all these languages that they need for which this technology could maybe create opportunities, you don't have anything to start training with. But, so you, you would need, I mean, I don't know, like, I don't know, for Irish, there's actually quite some data, uh, but for would, Irish machine would translation- low, uh, Irish would yeah, be a low resource language? Okay. Not so much because, but they have issues with finding enough translators, I think, in yeah. Irish. So their machine translation does uh, a big chunk, I think, of the, of the work, but it's, yeah, I, I don't know what a low resource language is. That is a question that Dimi and I have once had a conversation <laughs> about, and we cannot find a proper definition of yeah. that. It, it really so, depends. Um, actually, I, so I, uh, I come from the south of the Netherlands and, and that part of the Netherlands has lots of dialects and there are actually something like between, uh, if you, uh, between 50 and 100 dialects there, every little village has its own dialect. But of course, lots of these are related to each other. So I can imagine that you use a, a model trained for one of them to go to yeah. another one. To do knowledge transfer and to bootstrap a model with, with awesome. one language, yeah. These are all techniques that are being used in, in uh, low resource machine translation. Um, but I think we might need to clarify what we mean by low resource because a neural machine translation system needs millions yeah. of parallel yeah, sentences, right? And you need this for every, like if you want to translate English into whatever, then you need it for all these languages, you need multiple millions. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah because you say millions, but then I think if you mention 200,000 words in English or even 50,000 words, then million is not enough. 10 million is probably not enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, like the the proper commercial models, they use a lot more than that. But yeah. I think in English, Dutch, in uh, in Google, is fifteen million. It's trying on fifteen million. But okay. to get but something, maybe I, I'm wrong. But I think that that's what I, I heard someone. Yeah, point. it's probably also the most common things that people want translated. Yeah. So that can be. But like, the, these are sentences, right? You have parallel sentences. Let's say fifteen million parallel sentences that you throw in in your neural machine translation system and then the system will learn from that. Um, but you have, let's say, uh, languages like language pairs, like Bulgarian and Japanese. Parallel data for these languages, there is not enough parallel data. We have in the European language families, we, we have quite some parallel data because of the European Parliament proceedings, and these are all translated and, and narrated in the official languages. So we do have all this Kind of parallel, but if we talk about Bulgarian and, and Japanese or Bulgarian and Persian or Farsi, we, we don't have this data. Yeah. And so, if you want to train a system from uh, Bulgarian to, to Japanese, then you will fail, and then you have to go through another language to yeah. get this data. So, you can do something like a pivot machine translation system or a zero shot machine, machine translation system. These are two different approaches. Yeah. To, to bypass this issue. So, yeah. yeah, I think the low resource Bulgarian is not low resource, Japanese is not low resource, but then if you want so, the machine translation system for those, then mm -hmm. they become a low research. Yeah, I understand resource because you don't have the translations. Hey, if I can, are you going to solve the gender <laughs> problem in the future? So what, uh, what, are, what are your plans? Uh, in, Oh, I submitted a grant, so I hope <laughs> that I will get money to work on it. Uh, I mainly need money and good ideas. <laughs> um, I think that for gender, there is a possibility to actually pr make a lot of progress because, again, this is part of the grammar of the language. So I think, it, in theory, it should really be possible to fix this. I cannot fix this for all language pairs because I don't know all okay. language pairs, but I could focus on one language pair delve into what the differences are between those two language pairs and try to feed the system with the information needed for 
this particular uh, so would combination. would bring the linguistic knowledge that you have into the yes. translate. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and, and teach that to the computer. Yeah, and just provide it with additional information, basically, that, that it needs, or teach it at least that it doesn't know that it shouldn't be so certain about some translations that I, or, or be able to control somehow the output. Yeah, because I can imagine if you keep training those models once they exist, then the models are probably going to get trained at some point with their own generated data and then the biases only will become bigger. Yes, and it's not just on the level of, of uh, gender or, or something like that. Like Dimi and I have done some other research. It's it's on the level of language in general, words get lost, more and more words get lost. And if you, every time basically you pass it through such a system, your language is a bit more poor. So you can imagine if you keep on doing this at the end, I mean, I don't know what's gonna well, happen. There's yeah. probably, it stagnates, but. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but there's probably a core set of words that will at least remain. And then, yeah. but yeah. the more rare words, people use them less and less because they're not occurring in translations, okay. And this can have an effect on the grammar because sometimes it might be endings of, of verbs or, or you know, and that's problematic because that's wrong. Like there's no discussion about that. Yeah. Like not, not always losing words is wrong because sometimes you have a very, sure. very uh, specific translation which does not to be rich. Like if you're translating, what was it, manuals of uh, yeah, washing sure. machines, you don't need You want reach. it to be consequent. And, yeah. And yeah. So. So you need consistency, you need specific terminology to be translated correct, correctly, and, and that's it. You don't need to be to have a rich language. But for novels and literature and many other use cases, you do need uh, yeah. that. Yeah, and that's again a rare set, uh, low resource novel. But uh, Demi, but uh, are you uh, are you working on? Well, as I said, uh, I'm working on a sign language translation now, so um, yeah. and don't get me started with that. <laughs> it's a whole <laughs> another Pandora yeah. box. There. But the plans for the future? I mean, that sign language that is a project that you. It's a project, uh, yeah. It's a project uh, I'm leading until the end of 2023, and uh, hopefully we will get some nice results. And hopefully, actually, what we are we are trying to build now is this kind of a baseline framework and concept about how to approach machine translation for sign languages. And of course, as I said, if there is money to continue working on that, <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, I also understood you you want to start some kind of like a machine translation lab and we'll work together with a couple of people. So we, we actually ah, yes, that's, in the department have good. multiple people uh, who work on machine translation and probably you are the two that, that draw this, that pull this forward. Yes, yeah. it's called MT++. Has so, already started? Yeah, we have started last year already, but we've been, you know, just bouncing ideas, having... Okay, but you, you, you have a web presence or... A... Uh, Shabbat was going to take is, care of that. There is actually a website that is being developed at the moment. Uh, the, frame, well, the frame is developed, we just need to populate the content. I think that there is also a hashtag uh, on Twitter. Yes, yes, we uh, have a Twitter yes, handle. We have a <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter.